since we're having a um, May 4th webinar. So you are in the right place. This is the Safe Routes to School webinar. Enjoy some Star Wars jokes <laughs> while you're getting settled in. All right, welcome to the Safe Routes to School webinar. It's just around 11 o'clock. We're gonna let a couple more people continue to join us. Um, we had about, probably about 100 or so uh, sign up. So we're gonna give, um, give folks another minute to join. You are in the right place. This is the Safe Routes to School webinar. I'm going to send a couple, I'm getting a couple of emails from people. Um, so I'm going to so quickly send them the link. Make sure they get it. All right, so a couple more people join. All right, again, you're at the you're in the Safe Routes to School webinar. Welcome, and I'm gonna keep my email up over to the side for the first couple of minutes in case folks have a hard time joining. And then I will ignore from then on out so that we don't, it's not too distracting. They can watch the video. So, um, all right, I say we go ahead and get started. Katie, are you ready? Yep, okay, so. Um, welcome everyone. This is the Safe Routes to School. Um, this is the Safe Routes to School webinar. Um, you are, we're going to talk today about construction grants and the project identification program. And today uh, I will be speaking. My name is Leanne Ferguson and also Katie Salin from Alta Planning and Design. And it is May 4th. So um, I grew up with Star Wars and um, uh, today we're having a slight homage to Star Wars, so here are a couple of trivia questions slash jokes, mostly jokes, and, and then we'll have the answers at the end of the presentation. We'll keep the chat box on for about five minutes or so if anyone else is really into Star Wars and wants to give their best guess at answering any of these jokes. Um, so a little bit more about me. Again, my name is Leanne Ferguson. I work for uh, ODOT and the, and the Safe Routes to School Infrastructure Program Manager. I um, have been working for ODOT for about two years, but I've been working in Safe Routes to School for 12 years or so and come at it from the education background, from an education background. I have a real strong passion for kids and health and um, activity, getting outside and giving them access to the world around them. So Safe Routes to School for me is a really good fit specifically this um, infrastructure program that helps us build projects that gets kids out, um, gives them the opportunity to explore their world, have access to education and jobs and all kinds of things uh, if we allow them to, to walk and bike and give them that freedom. 
Um, my co-presenter today is Katie Salin from Alta Planning and Design. Katie, can you give a quick introduction? Yeah, thanks, Leanne. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Celine. I'm a planner at Alta Planning and Design. We're an active transportation planning, design, and engineering consulting firm based in Portland. And I specialize in safe routes to school planning and programming, as well as leading our public engagement service area. And um, I've been working with Leanne over the um, past couple of years to conduct the planning assistance for the project identification program and helping with um, grant program evaluation and um, data collection for the competitive grants. And I'm really excited to be on the call today to share and help answer questions about this great program. Great, thanks for being here, Katie. So an overview of today's um, presentation. And again, we'll have the Q&A box open for you to uh, ask any questions you have. Please use the question uh, function of Zoom. And um, if you're unable to find it, we're going to leave our chat open for a couple more minutes. But um, let us know if you're unable to find anything and we can um, help show, show folks how to do it. Um, but we're going to use the Q&A function and Katie's going to help sort of um, uh, answer or ask questions out loud during the presentation. If we start getting short on time, we'll keep them all for the Q&A at the end, but we should have plenty of time for Q&A. So today we'll talk about what is Safe Routes to School, um, funding for Safe Routes to School, uh, specifically the Safe Routes to Schools construction program where we have funding for construction projects as well as planning assistance to create a Safe Routes to School plan. Um, the solicitation is open now through the summer and we'll have tips for developing a great proposal and have lots of time for Q&A at the end. So what, is, oh, also side note, this um, is being recorded. So we wanted to let folks know that this, this webinar is being recorded. We will post it afterwards for anyone else who wants to watch or anything you want to review or rewatch. So what is Safe Routes to School? So um, if we were all in person, um, I would make everybody take guesses of what are the six E's for Safe Routes to School. Um, so go ahead and start thinking about Safe Routes to School in your head. Um, if you know any of the six E's, and here they are. So our six E's for Safe Routes to School are um, education to make sure that we are um, teaching our kids how to walk and bike safely, how to navigate an intersection, how to ride safely on the road, how to cross the street safely, um, encouragement activities like walk and bike to school day, um, like walking school buses, uh, ways to encourage kids and families to choose walking and biking to school, um, partnering with enforcement, which is your local police department to help encourage parents to have um, good behavior around schools as well as the students, evaluation like uh, hand tallies or, or uh, hand tallies where we determine how many kids walk and bike to school, parent surveys, so we determine what are some of the barriers, um, making sure that the programs that we're doing are working for our, for our students. Equity, we want to make sure that we're reaching the, uh, the most, the communities with most need first. And engineering, which is where we'll focus most of our time today, um, talking about building construction projects that allow students to be able to access school through walking and rolling. So when all six of those E's happen at the same time, we generally see a increase in students walking and biking to school, which is a really good bang for your buck. Um, if you're doing a construction project and you add some education and encouragement onto that, you can see a really big increase in the number of kids using that feature just by letting them know about it, let them know how to use it safely, and vice versa if we're, if we're just educating kids how to um, walk and bike safely without giving them the actual infrastructure. We're not doing the whole, the whole picture. So we really encourage communities to do all six E's of safe routes to school and ODOT's really um, challenging ourselves to do that as well. So um, along that line, we have a, ODOT has a non-infrastructure program, which is the education encouragement enforcement side um, as sort of a sister project to our infrastructure program, which is what we'll talk mostly about today. But that program is funded at about $1 million a year it runs a competitive grant cycle every three years. We're in the first year of a three-year cycle right now. 
what that looks like is, um, and the next one will be open in 2022, what that looks like is grant funding for your community to build basically capacity building so you can hire someone to be a Safe Routes to School coordinator that helps schools and teachers and parents and students um, get that education and encouragement part of the Safe Routes to School program. Um, for that uh, program, school districts, local agencies, and community-based organizations may apply. Again, the next round will be in about 2022. Also, year-round, we have Safe Routes to School resources that are located on the Oregon Safe Routes to School site, which I actually have pulled up here. Um, it's OregonSafeRoutes.org, and you can look under resources. And there are just a lot of resources here to help communities try to get at all of those E's and really help kids walk and bike to school. So um, Oregon Safe Routes is a great website and the project manager, ah, the project manager for the Safe Routes to School program is Heidi Manlove. So you can give her a, an email um, if you're interested in more, any more about those resources. Um, so we'll focus today on the Safe Routes to School construction program and the construction funding. So um, in House Bill 2017, there was uh, some, some of that uh, additional funding that the state raised through a gas tax increase was given to a pot, a Safe Routes to School fund at $10 million a year, increasing to $15 million in 2023. So we are, the construction program that we're talking about right now is the program that's helping allocate that $10 million a year to communities and to projects to help kids walk and bike to school. Um, it's funded through a rule called ORS 737025 for the nerds out there that love to read rules. Um, and it is guided by Safe Routes to School Advisory Committee. Um, so some key dates to remember while we're talking is um, June 15th is a letter of intent is due and August 31st is when the application is due. And now we'll do a little bit of, more of an overview about the program. So um, that $10 million a year goes into a Safe Routes to School fund. So for this round, we're sort of batching a couple of years together. So for this next round of funds, uh, fiscal year 21 and 22, we'll have about $30 million to use for Safe Routes to School construction. What that looks like is it's divided into three different programs. The first program is a competitive program. So that's where 87.5% of that, of that $30 million for this next chunk of, of funds will be used to build street safety projects near schools. And that's what you're all um, looking to apply for. Um, we also have a rapid response grant program where we can use up to 2.5% of those funds to um, address needs between competitive cycles. So we run a competitive cycle every two years. The rapid response funds can be accessed anytime during that time. And it's for really high need, high urgent projects. And we'll go into more about what exactly that means. But up to 2.5% of, of the funds can be spent for that. And then finally, the project identification program, um, I'm sorry, the rapid response program is up to 10%. Up to 2.5% can be spent on project planning um, or project identification, and that is to help communities identify projects and create a safe routes to school plan. So we can send a consultant to your community to help you do that with these funds. And we'll go into all three of these programs next. We'll start with project identification because it's one of the ones that I'm really, really excited right now about right now. And we're um, seeing a lot of great work happening on the ground around this program for this round. So we'll, I'll do a description, timeline, eligibility, and process. So our planning assistance description, what you will get at the end of this program or um, service, you would get a Safe Routes to School plan. It would tell you, it would help it would have your community prioritize the construction projects that you want to have done, as well as the softer side, the education and encouragement programs that you would like to do. It'll help identify funding sources for those things. It'll help identify goals around those things. And by the end of it, you'll have a publicly adopted plan, a Safe Routes to School plan that you can use for fundraising and program implementation. Um, ODOT's consultant will work on behalf um, of you to help create this plan. So um, what your responsibility will be is that the school community and the road authority have to work together to create this plan. It's the only way that it works. Um, so you would need to create a project management team 
with the road authority, whoever owns the, the roads near the school and the school community. So the, so whoever the principal or someone from the district office that would um, work together to be on this project management team. Um, uh, the city of Pendleton will be a sort of a case study that we'll do at the end of this presentation and Katie will give a little bit more information about that. Katie, would you like to give like a little preview of the, of what we'll have at the end of the, pres uh, uh, near the end of our um, workshop? Yeah, yeah, at the end, I'll just give a couple of examples, uh, City of Pendleton being one of them, of um, different ways that communities that we worked with in the past round of um, project identification programs, how they're already using their favorite routes to school plans, um, and how uh, the sort of similar tools and structure of completing the safe routes to school plan was um, able to be adapted and um, useful for different size communities and um, different contexts, um, as well as I'll show a couple of examples of um, the products and tools that we used um, in, in the Safe to School planning process. Great, thank you. Um, a little bit on the timing is our application materials are already up on the um, ODOT Safe Routes to School website. There's an optional letter of intent that is due on June 15th and then the application is due August 31st. It's a pretty simple application. It's not very long. Um, all we're looking for is that commitment that the school community and the road authority will be able to work together. Um, so after all of the applications are received, we will score the applications and we will notify communities in around November of the communities that have been chosen um, to get this service. Um, eligibility school districts are eligible to apply as well as publicly funded agencies, cities, counties, transit districts, tribes, any other road authority. Um, so this is the program that we have out right now that school districts are able to apply for. Our other two programs are specifically for cities and counties, but they must have the support of the school district. But this one school districts can apply for. We are going to prioritize communities that have high safety risk factors, uh, traffic safety, so such as fast roads, wide roads, um, a lot of uh, crossing space. Um, lots of average and uh, lots of traffic as well as high history of crashes. We're also looking to fund um, low income populations, uh, populations with low income uh, uh, communities that don't have a capacity to plan for safe routes to school. So um, we wanna help where there is no capacity as well as again, all partners must participate. So the school community as well as the road authority must all participate. We will be able to um, do this uh, process for about 30 different communities. Um, once you are uh, so, um, notified that you've been selected, we will ask for confirmation of commitment from all of the different partners. And then we will uh, schedule with you this 21 week process that ends in a, safe, a completed safe routes to school plan. Again, this is um, one of my uh, favorite programs that we're doing right now and um, I'm really excited about it. We were undersubscribed during the last round. We didn't really get the word out as well. So I'm really looking forward to seeing um, folks applications this round. If you, um, where you can find the application is um, how I find ODOT's Safe Routes to School page is I always Google it because searching through the ODOT <laughs> web sphere is very difficult. So um, you can Google ODOT Safe Routes to School and at the top of the page, um, we've got active grant solicitations kind of pulled out at the top so you don't have to go digging for it. And we've got the project identification program that you can look down into the application documents and reference information. And that's where you find the letter of intent and the online application. Both of these documents are online so you can poke around in them and look at them and send me any questions that you have. Okay. Next, we have the competitive grant process um, for the construction for the construction. Um, well, yeah, we have a couple questions if you yeah. want to pause, yeah, pause and answer those. Um, yeah, answer. Great. Um, one question, how much was available in the last cycle of the competitive grant portion? Uh, in the last cycle of the competitive construction grant, which we're about to talk about was 16 million and there's 26 million available this round. So we'll have more funding to be able to allocate this round. 
Great. Um, and then second question here, um, if a community applied for a non-infrastructure grant but didn't receive it, should they apply for a PIP grant or is the non-infrastructure grant the first step? No, I'd say go ahead and apply for the PIP program. I actually think the PIP program would be a great first, it would be also a great first step. It'll really set you up to apply for non-infrastructure funding in the future. And um, that kind of planning is sort of, if you get a non-infrastructure grant, the first year would be doing that kind of planning. So if you already have your planning done, you don't need to spend your first year doing it. So um, this will give you, this will, this will help. I would say go ahead and apply for the PIP, absolutely. Great questions. And then um, third question we've got at the moment is, can applications from past years get some feedback about why they were not funded? Yeah, so um, I have a, um, a webinar that I did after the last round that really went through exactly how those um, uh, applications were scored. And if you send me an email, um, I can uh, send you a little bit more detailed information of how your project was scored, and then I can answer any questions after that. Um, it ta generally takes me about the, the back end of our scoring process was was I have so many ideas for how to do it better is the best way to say it and it takes me about 20 minutes or so to pull together all the information so it might take me a little while so give me some time so if you send me an email now in about a week I might be able to uh, I'd, I'd probably commit to about a week to um, to get it to you unless I got a whole bunch of requests and then it would take a long time so it just takes me a little while to get it thanks for your patience <laughs> And then one more, one more quick question here, um, which I believe you're going to address in the next section, but um, is the criteria going to be the same as the last round of funding? We will address that in this next section. It's going to be very similar with a couple of small differences and we'll, and I'll move forward now. Thanks, Katie. Uh, and maybe um, uh, we'll answer all the questions on this round before we go to the rapid response program and we'll kind of do it that way unless we start running low on time. Okay, so the next section we'll talk about the competitive construction program, timeline eligibility, match project selection, and project delivery. So for this, um, for the construction program this round, we have about 26 million. Last time we had about 16 and now we have 26, which is great. The letter of intent is due on June 15th. On June 1st, our application, um, we'll start accepting applications uh, through August 31st. You can access the application right now, but we won't start accepting till June 1st. Um, there might be a couple of small tweaks that, we'll, that we need to make to the application between now and then, but nothing major will happen, but that's why we don't want to start accepting early. Um, also in September and October, we will review the applications. Then our Safe Routes to School Advisory Committee will make the final recommendation. And in um, December, it will, that recommendation will go to the Oregon Transportation Commission, and then in January, uh, agreements will be signed and projects will start to be built. Who can apply for this program? Um, cities, counties, ODOT, tribes, transit districts, any other road authority. You'll notice that school districts aren't on this um, eligible list of folks who can apply, but school districts play a main big role in um, helping identify the projects as well as supporting the projects that um, that do get submitted so so you must have the support of your school or school district in order to submit a project so the project eligibility is kind of a long list and we'll go through each of these in detail this is pretty much the same list as the last time around the only thing that's different is this commitment to outreach and we'll go into what that means and um, there are a couple of slight differences in some of these, but basically it's the same as the last round. So you must have support of the school or school district. The letter of support is required and we'll provide, we've provided a, a, a sample for you to, um, to use. It, um, it must be within a one mile radius of a school. So one mile as the crow flies. So draw that, drawing that circle around the school. We also have a, um, a map that can help show that uh, show that one mile. This is in the resources on the ODOT Safe Routes to School page. So if you zoom in and you click on a school, it'll show you that. Um, zoom in, it'll show you that mile radius around the school. 
It must be on a public road right of way. So, um, uh, and the public road right of way is something that is already public road right of way, like a, like a, or right parallel to the public road right of way and touching it. Um, it's, it's right of way that is going to be purchased, public road right of way that's going to be purchased. And it could be referenced in a plan as the site of a future road, but it has to be in the public road right of way. What is not public road right of way is things like school property, private property, and an off street path that's not right next to the road. So um, this is a limitation of the funds that we have for safe routes to school. And um, this is one of the main things that we saw in our first round is that some people were submitting projects that weren't on the public road right of way. Um, for this winter, um, ODOT will be um, rolling out a new paths program that can fund some paths in Oregon. So any application that we receive that, it, that does not appear to be on the public road right of way will probably recommend that you apply for the paths program. Um, the project must address a barrier to students walking and biking to school. The maximum request is, can only be $2 million and the minimum is $60,000. Um, here are some examples of projects that we intend to fund uh, with, this, with this money. It's very it's mostly sidewalks, crosswalks, rapid flashing beacons, pedestrian um, islands. Um, we'll have some more slides showing some more details of, of projects that we would recommend. Um, you'll notice that paving is, is <laughs> pulled out and marked out on this slide. Um, we don't want to fund is repaving um, projects. So we will um, please include the paving that you must have in order to complete the project, but please don't include paving of the whole road. Just the paving that you must have to complete the project. Commitment to outreach is the new uh, criteria for with Safe Routes to School infrastructure grants. So the um, applicant must commit to completing an awareness and safety outreach campaign at a minimum level. So what that minimum level will look like is um, sending home a piece of backpack mail with students, uh, a newsletter article for the school newsletter, and a press release. And ODOT will provide templates for all of these um, things. And um, it's also included this year in the school commitment um, letter that, that these are some things that the school will also allow to happen. So we really wanna do a minimum level of education if you're not already doing another education pieces um, because of that um, increase in behavior change that we see when, when that's done as well as the decrease in injuries. So that is a requirement this year, is a commitment to a minimum level of outreach. Uh, the project must be aligned with a plan. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be in a plan, it just has to be aligned with a policy in a plan. Often Safe Routes to School projects are really small and not necessarily called out specifically in a plan. So it just needs to be aligned with a plan. Examples of these plans are like a transportation system plan or any other locally adopted plan. Um, a more specific plan that probably will call out your project would be like a Safe Routes to School plan um, that you can get through the project identification program, as well as a Safe Routes to School action plan, which is a way more like community-based plan that generally um, like a PTA at a school or something might pull together. There's a local cash match requirement. Um, you must provide 40% cash match, or it can be reduced to 20% if one of the following applies. Um, and most of our projects will be eligible for the 20% cash match because we are um, gearing towards low income communities. So um, if the school site qualifies as a Title I school or a school where 40% or more students are eligible for free and reduced lunch, then you're eligible for this reduced match. And we anticipate that most, most schools applied will be um, a low income school. Also, the school, if it's located in a city of 5,000 or less, then you're eligible for the reduced match, as well as if it reduces hazards on a priority safety corridor. And all that means is that this is a corridor with some high safety needs, and we'll go over what that means. But if it meets those any one of those criteria, then you're eligible for the 20% cash match. So um, cash match is actual funds provided by the applicant that are reasonable, necessary, and directly related to the project. Um, it's not a soft match, so volunteer time, anything like that does not count. It's a hard cash match. Um, and this is also a slight difference from the last round. 
um, where uh, we are going to um, allow applicants to use match from five years prior of submitting the application. Um, in the first round, this cutoff was two years prior. And what that looks like is if four years ago you built a sidewalk in front of a school, but you couldn't finish it, and now you want to apply for safe routes to school funds to finish that sidewalk, you can use the expenditures from that sidewalk that you built four years ago as the local cash match for the um, ad additional sidewalk that you're planning to build. And we'll go over a couple more examples of, of that too later on. Title I schools refer to a school in which children, um, families, low-income families make up at least 40% of, uh, of the students enrolled. And we generally see that as the students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch. That's how it's mostly, um, that's how it's calculated. So priority safety corridor, this is another way that you can receive the um, reduced cash match. So a priority safety corridor is um, an area with high risk factors. So it is a road uh, that has, that's 40 miles an hour uh, speed limit or 85th percentile. That itself is a priority safety corridor. Or if two or more of the following exist, if the speed limit is 30 miles an hour or greater, if there are more than two lanes or a crossing distance of 30 feet, if there are 12,000 uh, average, annual average daily vehicles um, or greater, or if it has a demonstrated history of crashes related to school traffic. And we'll go a little into a little bit more detail about what, um, how we calculate those in the next couple of slides. So the, um, those are all of the requirements for the Safe Routes to School project. So once you've got your project in mind, then you can fill out your letter of intent and it is required by June 15th. It just helps confirm all those eligibility because we know there's a lot of them. It's a high level problem and solution description as well as your information, the school information, and we're asking for a general sense of how much you think you will apply for. Um, and then we'll have our application due on August 31st. So it'll have a lot of that information, plus the specifics of the project, the safety information, cost estimate, um, maps and photos, support letters, as well as your signatures. So, um, so those are the two, two documents that are required. We also have a um, project selection committee. That selection committee helped us create the score, scoring process for the applications this round. They'll also review all of the applications and come up with the recommendation list that will go to the Oregon Transportation Commission in December, or we anticipate in December. Um, they also consult with the Oregon Transportation Safety Committee as well as the Oregon Bike and Pet Advisory Committee. This is a committee of 18 people that are made up of representatives from Safe Routes to School practitioners, the health community, tribal communities, school districts, um, police force, uh, transit, um, advocates. Um, it's a really good group of smart people that are helping us um, determine how to prioritize um, all the great projects that come in. So this next three slides are the um, sort of the high level scoring criteria that that committee came up with and approved um, and that went to the OTC a couple weeks ago. So the first step whenever we receive applications is staff will go through and look to see kind of if there are any any questions or any red flags and the things that we're looking for is to make to see if the project project description um, it would be a kind of a red flag if the description didn't match the problem, like the, the description of the problem doesn't match the problem. Um, we're also looking to see if the project scope and the project description appear to be um, out of alignment. Um, we're also looking to make sure that you checked off all of those um, eligibility criteria boxes. Um, we are looking to, um, we'll do a ground conditions review. Uh, most of that will be an online Google review. Um, of to make sure that the application and the um, ground conditions kind of match up and any other sort of big issue that we see. If, if we have any issues, we will reach out to you and give you an opportunity to address those issues and update your application. 
Um, next, step two is going to be the scoring of the applications. Um, the, uh, the, the focus area for this round uh, is the same as the last round, and that's going to be uh, social equity and making sure that we are addressing the needs of the communities that need it most first. So um, we're looking at the reduced, uh, free and reduced lunch rate at schools. Um, for an example, if your school had 61% of students receiving free and reduced lunch, then your application would get 120 points for that category. Um, the other three categories uh, or, or sort of data points that we're looking at that, that you can get a couple of additional points are um, in the school, there's a group uh, or they, they, they track a group of, of students called Ever English Learners, which are students learning um, English as a second language. And if the percentage of Ever English Learners in that school is above the state average of 23%, then you would get an additional five points. If the non-white student rate is above the state average of 35%, you would get an additional five points. And if the chronic absenteeism rate is above the state average of 20%, you would get an additional five points. So what that looks like is um, you can look at the, if you Google um, Oregon school report card, you can, you can find, you can find a, uh, sorry, <laughs> doing two things at once. You can find a school report card for your um, elementary school. So if you look in your elementary school and then you can find their school report card, this is what it looks like. So how you find things like Ever English Learner is down here, 7% at this school. Where you find your free and reduced lunch rate is right here. Where you find your demographics and your non-white students is right here. And where you find your chronic absenteeism number is right here. And basically uh, the, the, the percentage of students that are chronically absent are the regular attenders minus 100. So 25% so, um, of the students of this school are chronically absent. Um, so that's how you find all of that information for your application. And this is how we'll score it. Also very heavily weighted are readiness and safety. For readiness, we're looking at um, things like where are you in purchasing your right of way? Um, how far along are you in the public process? And are there gonna be any big environmental concerns and how have you mitigated those? Um, for public process, I put an asterisk here because of, of COVID-19. Um, and uh, we realize that schools are not open and you might not be able to do some of the outreach that you were intending to do. Um, so, uh, so, so we, we are taking that into consideration and we will um, score consistently across all applicants, depending on what the availability to do public process is at the time. The, um, so basically do, do, you, do your best and, and you won't get dinged for, um, for anything COVID-19 related. Um, the lower risk readiness factors are things like stormwater, utilities, design, um, uh, where are you in that process? Are those, are, are those um, any problems with those things mitigated? For the safety section, we were, are, we are, uh, we'll give points based on um, injuries and fatalities. Um, so bicyclist and pedestrian crash between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. We're also using speed. You'll get more points for a higher speed. Um, also more points for um, the more uh, uh, lanes or crossing distance and more points for the higher average annual daily traffic. And now thinking back to whenever we determined if your project was a priority safety corridor or not that allowed you to have the lower reduced match that you're, you'll see that come up again in the scoring. If you're a priority safety corridor, you'll get an additional 40 points. Um, and one of the ways that you can um, find some of the crash information, we put it, oh, sorry, we put it on this map that I showed you before that um, shows you a, a mile radius around schools. This also has um, fatal and non-fatal crashes um, that are all in the ODOT database. So we know that there are more crashes than that. Um, but, if, but if you wanna see the ODOT database crashes, they are located on, on this map. 
Um, then the school type is pretty heavily weighted. So we're looking for pre-kindergarten to eighth grade or any combination of those grades um, at the school in which you're, uh, that's your focus school. And our, um, we'll also give a slight benefit to projects that are closer to the elementary school. So this is a very similar um, way to score than the first round. There are some tweaks that are a little bit different, um, uh, but I think this is a, that, that we made some, that the, that the committee made some good, some good suggestions. So after the project is scored, um, then it will, will have like in general, a like 100% list and 150% list for the funds available. Um, and then it'll go to the committee to have a larger discussion. And the committee will um, use three lenses to review the 100% the, the list and 150% list. And the first one being that each applicant can only receive $2 million total. So if you uh, applied in one grant for the maximum of 2 million and that project is in the 100% list, uh, then you won't get any other project awarded. You'll just get that $2 million project awarded. But if you applied for four projects, all uh, 500,000, and they all got into the 100% list, then you would be awarded all of those projects. So the maximum amount you can receive total would be $2 million. Um, also, using new applicants as a, as a small filter, if two projects are very close in score and right on the cut list, the committee may choose the applicant that has not received funding before or doesn't have a current um, open project. So if you if you received funding but your but your project is in essence done, then you would you could you you would fall into like that new applicant category. And finally, cost effectiveness. If two projects are really close in score and right on the cut line, um, the committee may decide to choose smaller projects with shorter timelines as opposed to one larger project. Um, again, if those are projects are all really close in score and right on the cut line. A little bit about project delivery. Um, we're looking for projects that can begin as soon as possible, uh, start expending fund within two years and finish within five years. And those are two grant requirements. You must start spending within two years of signing the agreement and completed within five years. Also, this is a reimbursement grant, so we will be reimbursing you for funds that you've already spent once the IGA is started. A small exception that will start this round of projects, and it's for communities under 5,000. They can request a small upfront um, influx of funds just to get started, and that's just it's similar to this uh, small city allotment program. <laughs> it's similar to the small city allotment program, so for communities under 5,000. You'll, you're required to submit quarterly progress report, reports. And again, you must include that, that small level of outreach. Okay, so that's the end of the construction program. Um, I was gonna give a little bit of an overview about the rapid response before we go into the tips. Um, do you have uh, a couple questions, Katie, that you wanna? I bet you yeah, have a... <laughs> there's, there's, yeah, there's, we've got 10 questions in here now. We could answer a couple of them and then save more until the end. Yeah, let's spend about five minutes answering questions and then and then uh, we can save the rest for the end. Okay. Yeah, we'll see how many we can get through. Yeah. Um, the first question here, um, in the last round of Safe Routes to School infrastructure grants, projects that needed to install asphalt in the roadway to build curb and gutter and sidewalk seem to be marked down because desire to focus the available funding on bike ped specific infrastructure. Will that criteria be the same this time? We have some great projects where we could install sidewalks but would need to install asphalt in order to do so. We're wondering if we should invest time in applying for those or focus on other projects that do not include any roadway paving. You can definitely include roadway paving, but again, just for the just for the part of the road that you need that that you're doing the curb and gutter. So if there's any way to if you want to pave the entire road, which would make sense um, if you can use another funding source to do that additional paving and just um, do the the small amount of paving that you need to do to do curb and gutter. Um, 
for, with the Safe Routes to School program. So we we're, I'm, I'm, we're definitely happy to fund curb and gutter, especially if you need to have it for the sidewalk. Um, it's it's the sort of the the repaving of the whole road is where um, is where we're sort of pushing back against that. But definitely apply for that. Um, there's no scoring criteria that will that will um, reduce your score. It more has to do with um, we have a very small amount of funding and a large need. So we're really trying to um, cut those things that, were, that, that, that could be considered a roadway project and really just focusing on the bike ped. But curb and gutter can definitely be um, part of that bike ped if you need it in order to build a sidewalk. Great, um, next question here. Um, is pavement widening for pedestrian use only instead of a raised sidewalk eligible? pavement markings or other delineators could be used to separate the pedestrian from auto users. Yeah, that's eligible. We'll go into some suggestions, but, um, but those, are, those are eligible. Couple, I think, quick ones here. Um, we're a public charter school. If I heard correctly, we cannot apply for this grant. Correct. Um, yeah. If there are um, projects needed in our area, the city would need to apply and we could coordinate with them. Yes, absolutely. And I'd be happy to talk to anyone at your city to, to tell them more about it. Um, are high schools eligible? High schools are eligible. They don't get those additional 90 points. But if there is a project with a strong, um, with with a really strong point structure in the other areas, then it could, I think that a high school project could get funded. Would a sidewalk the school district was required to build in the public right of way in the last five years be able to be counted for part of the match? The school, uh, say that one, one more time. I think the answer uh, would is a yes. sidewalk that the school district was required to build in the public right-of-way in the last five years be able to be counted for part of the match. Yes, but, but we will talk a little bit more about what that looks like. You need to describe the larger project. You need to describe it in a way that that, that sidewalk is part of your larger project. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then uh, what if you're applying for an infrastructure project that includes two schools one of which is Title I and one of which is not. What is the cash, cash match requirement? Um, let's pause there and keep going. These are gonna take a little bit more time for me to, under, to, to understand some of the details. So I'm gonna keep going and then we'll take all of the rest of the questions during the Q&A. Perfect, all right. So back to the rapid response grants and program details. Um, the, we'll go over a little bit about eligibility and project selection. So remember the rapid response grants are the ones that are open um, uh, all the time. You can apply at any time. Uh, your project must meet all the requirements of the Safe Routes to School competitive grant, but also either be a timely opportunity or an urgent safety need. And the request maximum is 500,000. So we're looking for quick small projects that can help address a really urgent or time sensitive issue. So the timely opportunity is something that we haven't found an example of something that we've funded yet. Uh, the, the example that I can think of is something like a tornado goes through town and tears up your road and you're going to be redoing the road anyway, but um, uh, the communities wanted a pedestrian island there for a long time and you think you can just get it in if you have some extra funds to get that uh, pedestrian island in. So. Um, that is a timely opportunity that you could not have planned for. So that's sort of the key here, an opportunity that you could not have planned for. Um, and that is urgent and time sensitive, but it would have been impossible to plan for it. Uh, and the urgent safety need is if you have a bicycle or pedestrian crash where there is an injury or a fatality, um, that is the urgent safety need and you have a, a fix that you can do that would have affected that. An example of this, we just funded it. Um, some crosswalk improvements in Tillamook at a crosswalk where several students had been hit over the last six months. So um, that's the rapid response program, the selection process uh, as we accept applications and letters of intent on a rolling basis. Uh, we have a subcommittee that helps make those decisions of what projects to recommend and they ultimately go to the Oregon Transportation Commission. 
to get approval before we can move forward signing the agreement. All right, some tips for your proposals. We'll do uh, the competitive construction grants as well as the project identification program. So some additional resources are folks like your traffic safety coordinator in your region. These are all ODOT staff uh, and ODOT staff that work in your region that um, focus on safety. They might be great uh, people to bounce ideas off of around the non-infrastructure side, as well as active transportation liaisons who are also located in each region. They're great for bouncing ideas, uh, project ideas off of. Um, uh, they're great resources to know about. Also on the Oregon Safe Routes website, which is the site I showed you a little bit before with the, um, with the resources, there is a map where you can see if you have a Safe Routes to School coordinator in your area. Um, if you do have a Safe Routes to School coordinator, they're a great person to connect with uh, as you're thinking of applying for funds. Um, Safe Routes to School is kind of a bigger thing than just ODOT's program. It's a, big, it's a, it's a bigger movement here in Oregon. So the, sort of the three components of the larger Safe Routes to School movement is ODOT Safe Routes to School program. So we um, mostly provide funding and then some resources that are, that are better um, done at a statewide level. There's also the Safe Routes to School network, which is a loose group of practitioners that um, really work together to to exchange best practices, really try to identify what are the challenges that everybody's facing um, so that we can work towards it as a state. Um, this network is something that Heidi and I at the ODOT level, we coordinate with and we work with this group of people um, to help us get a better sense of what's going on in the state. And then there are a lot of local and regional Safe Routes to School programs um, that are funded through all different types of ways. There might be someone at your health department. There might be some, there might be a parent at the school that organizes a walk and bike to school day. Uh, there's a lot of like little pockets of safe routes to school happening all over the state, all funded through volunteer work or, or health funds or ODOT funds or local funds. Like there's a lot of different things happening around safe routes to school here in Oregon. So some tips to getting a better sense of what those things are is to sign up for ODOT updates. So you can Google ODOT Safe Routes to School and sign up to receive updates. You can also Google the ODOT Safe Routes to School Network, which is that page with resources and the map of the coordinators, and you can sign up for updates there. Those are the two best like, places to stay updated on what's going on in Oregon. Other key websites are the Oregon School Report Card website, which if you Google that, it will take you to the site where we um, where we looked up an elementary school and downloaded the school report card. Also the ODOT Safe Routes to School, some mapping tools and resources are the um, map that I showed you before that shows the mile radius around the schools and has some school information. We also have a map that shows our current projects um, and we're tracking our current, our, our, where our funds currently are. Both of those uh, maps are located on, you can get links to them on the ODOT Safe Routes to School site. Um, and then the Oregon Safe Routes to School page, that's the page where it's oregonsaferoutes.org. I should have had these a little bit better organized. So oregonsaferoutes.org is where you can find all of these resources, the map of your coordinators and see, uh, sign up to receive updates. So a little bit more about meeting the cash match requirement. Um, cash match can be local funds, state funds, or federal funds. The easiest way to meet the cash match requirement is to define a larger project where um, the Safe Routes to School funds portion is just a smaller piece. Um, the uh, one way to borrow money to meet the cash match is through the Oregon Transportation Infrastructure Bank. Um, that's a resource that has a really low interest rate um, and it can be a way to borrow funds to receive the match, as well as there are a couple of federal programs that aren't necessarily transportation but can be used for transportation projects and can be used as cash match. The Community Development Block Grants from Housing and Urban Development, as well as the Community Facility Grants from the USD Rural uh, Development Department. Um, those both have real specific eligibility um, for those communities, but um, your community might be eligible for those type of funds and you could spend them on construction projects and use that as cash match. 
So, so project example number one for cash match. So imagine that your existing project that you're that you've worked on in the last five years um, and spent money on has been resurfacing streets and fixing some curb ramps. So you can use the fixing the curb ramps as part of your cash match and then add your sidewalks and crossings as part of your safe routes to school fund. So your project in total would be like um, d the description would be like access to this school by walking and biking on sidewalks. So uh, um, you can kind of talk about it as one large project and then use the use the prior work as specific things that you did before and these are the things that you're filling in now. Project number two is um, you purchased right-of-way, you've already done um, preliminary air engineering to design things, and now you're adding your sidewalk and you're striping your bike lanes. So the match could have been that purchased right-of-way as well as uh, preliminary engineering, and then you can apply for Safe Routes to School funds to actually build it out. Um, and again, that match can be something that has been completed or spent in the last five years prior to submitting your application. So I'm going to pass it over to Katie for a minute to do a deeper dive into the project identification program with some examples. Great. Yeah, thanks, Leanne. Let me know, let me know um, when yeah. you need to change slides. Okay, sounds great. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I'll just share a couple of examples of our Safe Routes to School plan products and tools that we used, as well as um, some examples from communities that we worked with um, during the 2019 Safe Routes to School planning processes. Um, so one of the really special things about this planning assistance is how versatile and applicable it is in different types of communities. Um, and it's been really great um, as well to see communities already using their Safe Routes to School plans um, to make changes and um, get started building infrastructure. Um, so the city of Pendleton and Pendleton School District was one of our first batch of PIP communities in the fall. And um, they're a great example of uh, a community already using their plan to tackle smaller challenges in the, um, this winter and spring and then preparing for the Safe Routes to School grants. Um, the city of Pendleton has already added some signage and striping to address those smaller needs, um, such as the missing school zone signage um, and curb striping. And then last um, I talked to them, they're planning to apply for the competitive grant to address some larger needs, um, including some sidewalk infill near one of their elementary schools and um, the condemned staircase uh, you can see in the photo here. And then, um, the school district as well um, is using this kind of sad forced downtime um, to tackle some of the recommendations that were located on school property. So you can see um, in the photo here, um, the, super, the superintendent of the school district shared these photos um, from their middle school, they added um, some signage for um, student drop off and pick up. And then um, the uh, curb ramp here under construction and then the finished product um, that right there is where they uh, have their students with special needs um, load their buses and there wasn't a curb ramp there and um, they were able to just tackle that right away. Um, yeah, and then um, these recommendations were identified in their Safe Routes to School plan. Um, you can see here I wanted to show an example of the improvement maps that we make for each school um, that participates in the PIP process. So this was the plan, um, or pardon, the map for the middle school, and um, we break it out by uh, improvement recommendations for school grounds, and then um, for the different uh, locations that we observed during the walk audit. Next slide, yep. Um, and then uh, one another example here um, from our uh, PIP group in the fall, we worked with the city of Eagle Point 
an Equal Point school district, and um, they're a great example of an approach for citywide tips with multiple schools. Um, you can see here are some of their um, great bike path infrastructure, um, covered covered bridge, and then um, a scooter specific rack at um, one of the schools. Pretty neat. Um, next next slide. Um, yeah, so we created a suggested route map, such as um, the one you see here for all the schools and communities that we worked with. But for Equal Point, it became really evident um, that going a step further and establishing a Safe Routes to School priority network was going to allow them to prioritize improvements um, along the most important gaps and take advantage of existing bike ped connections and um, to incorporate wayfinding. And then two, two quick additional examples, um, just to show um, the, the breadth of circumstances that um, the Safe Routes to School plan uh, was, planning process was used. Uh, Days Creek um, Charter School in Douglas County unincorporated community with super limited bike ped infrastructure um, located along a county highway. Um, we focused on options for temporary, uh, potential for temporary pet improvements, um, and then ultimately made some long-term um, pretty major recommendations for sidewalks and realigning um, an intersection there. And then um, a lot of um, great discussions and work uh, coming up with non-infrastructure recommendations that might work um, in, a, in a circumstance where not a lot of students are going to be able to be walking and biking to school, um, such as on-campus bike pet education, um, school safety campaign with red signs and bumper stickers uh, to bring awareness to the school zone um, for people passing through. Um, and discussions of safe routes to bus stops. Uh, next slide. Um, and then pretty much the, the opposite context um, in the city of Staten, North Sandiam School District. Um, we worked with a, a couple of schools there, um, one of which the middle school has extremely busy congested crossing with hundreds of students walking and biking um, every day. And we brought our Safe Routes to School engineer in to help um, problem solve in this complicated intersection that's um, historically plagued the school and school um, and local jurisdiction for many years and um, set them up with a recommendation package to apply for the Safe Routes to School competitive grant. And then last, um, just two quick slides. Um, showing our public engagement tools that we use. Um, we use this interactive, interactive public um, web map to gather information at the start of the project, where the challenges are, um, what some of the routes that families are already taking to get to and from school. And then, um, next slide. And then we also use um, this interactive PDF to um, share our final safe routes to school plan or draft final um, and get feedback from uh, folks who had participated on whether um, our recommendations made sense um, or any other feedback there. Great. Thank you, Katie. Yeah, thanks. Um, so you'll notice that, that uh, the project identification program didn't just focus on things that were eligible for this narrow uh, ODOT Safe Routes to School project funding. Uh, they focused on things on school property, um, off system paths. So, um, so the ODOT Safe Routes to School infrastructure program is just sort of one funding pot that, uh, that the plan really helps choose projects for, but there's also a lot of other work that, that happens in there that is not necessarily eligible for ODOT, but it might be eligible for other funding sources. Um, so a couple of project ideas before we before we wrap up. Um, there are some key design guides that will really help 
um, you determine uh, what you can build that families will actually will actually use. So like the FHWA bicycle and pedestrian guide, there's a small town and rural multi multimodal design guide. ODOT has a bike and ped design guide. Um, ODOT has a blueprint for urban design. Um, there's also a countermeasure tool at www.pedbikesafe.org that really can help choose like what countermeasure you can choose for any particular problem. Um, some of the categories that we sort of have seen projects come in are projects that help kids cross the street, projects that help kids walk along the street, projects that slow traffic down, and kind of some other projects. So um, uh, crossing the street are things like marked crosswalks, curb extensions, uh, raised crosswalks, uh, rapid flashing beacons. Um, things that help kids walk along the side of the street are things like sidewalks, alternative walkways, which I think someone was kind of asking about before, like this sort of idea of this alternative walkway, as well as paved paths that are on the road right of way, that are in, I'm sorry, in the road right of way. Um, things that will slow traffic down are like school zones, speed bumps, that kind of stuff, and, and lighting and other features are also things that we know help kids um, walk and bike to school safer. So again, I want to um, bring up the paving um, reminder again, please only request the paving that you must do in order to do the, the bike and ped improvements. Um, we're going to be, uh, we'll probably be reaching out if, if there's too much paving in the application, we'll be reaching out and asking folks if they can reduce the amount of paving. Um, other types of crossing treatments, um, or here are just some uh, pictures of some of the types of crossing treatments that we talked about before. Um, uh, we'll stop there. Some best practices for sidewalks is that people will head towards the, um, the, the, the shortest distance. Um, you can notice right here where the sidewalk went around this post, but people actually keep cutting across here. So um, the shortest, shortest route, sidewalk best practice. Um, shy distance, uh, people generally would like a wider, wider space on a sidewalk so that they can pass someone comfortably. Um, as well as uh, not walk too close to a, a large wall. Um, we've all noticed this these days with um, COVID-19, like six feet is a really long, large distance. Um, uh, but generally our shy distance is, is, there's also some distance that generally people wanna stay away from people. Um, uh, no meandering. So this particular sidewalk is made to where you would really need to like dodge a lot of things um, in order to stay on a flat, uh, surface area, imagining people with disabilities, um, uh, students in, in, um, uh, in wheelchairs and other things, like you really want to make it as, as straight and as smooth and not meandering as possible. Also, best practice for ending, even though uh, a ramp onto the road is not a, uh, like the best ending for a sidewalk, it's way better than, than this just sort of ending right here where folks would just need to turn around. Um, Types of bicycle facilities, there's lots of different types of bicycles facilities. What we've realized is that um, the more we can kind of separate uh, bicyclists from traffic, the more likely families and, and students are gonna be, be able to use those facilities. Um, so there is a, um, in the blueprint for urban design, that's one of the guides that I mentioned earlier, um, there is a chart that you can kind of look to see what is the what what is the speed on the road as well as how many vehicles per day come across that road um, and they um, associate things in different tiers so imagine that we're looking at a 40 mile uh, road with 7,000 with 7,000 vehicles a day that would sort of be in tier one as opposed to a, a, a 25 mile an hour road with 2,000 that's tier three so those are two different two different solutions. Um, so uh, how you would choose is you would sort of look at the, the urban context and you would imagine that it's maybe it's a suburban fringe. Um, the, uh, the tier one, which is, sorry. The tier one, which is the um, higher speed, higher um, traffic roadway, uh, would 
would mean that you would need some sort of um, thing to separate in like flexible delineator posts or a barrier or a guardrail, like some kind of, some, some kind of separation. Um, but on the tier three, where it was a very slow speed with not very many um, vehicles, then you could maybe even have like a shared lane, um, like the uh, green streets that you see uh, in some of the bigger cities in Oregon, some sort of shared, shared lane, shared, shared road type of situation. Um, here are some examples for how to separate from traffic. How to separate bicyclists from traffic. And here are some examples of ways that um, folks have used flexible delineator posts as a way to separate from traffic. And that is the final slide of all of the information that I wanted to give you. Um, here are the answers to the Star Wars jokes from the beginning of the presentation. Um, my favorite one is probably how do Tuscan Raiders cheat at their taxes? And the answer is they always file single to hide their numbers, which I thought that was really, that's for the really uh, Star Wars nerds out there. Um, Q&A. So let's get to some of your questions. We have about 20 minutes left. We might be able to go a little bit over, but I'll bet we can, bet we can get them all done. Here we go. Here we go. Um, yeah, so the first one, um, what if you are applying for an infrastructure project that includes two schools, one of which is Title I and one of which is not, what is the cash match? So, um, unless those two schools were very close together, that might be two different applications, if that makes sense. Um, but the, to answer, assuming that it is all part of one big project, that, that it makes total sense to have it all as one big project, and you're able to describe that, um, then we would it, it would get scored based on the highest need section of the application. So it would be scored based on the Title I school. It would be scored based on whatever road um, was the highest safety road, um, if that makes sense. So it's scored based on the highest need. So we don't average out the score based on um, higher need areas and lower need areas. We just take the highest need area and score based on that. And so that's actually a good segue to one of the other questions that's in here, which is um, we are looking to apply for several small projects within a city that would be located within multiple schools. Should these be lumped into one request or separated into each specific school's project? If there is an efficiency in delivering them all together, and you can uh, and and you can describe that in a way that talks about them all as one project. Then I think that you could make the case that it's all one project. Um, that so the example that I can think of is like uh, we need to put in a bunch of curb ramps. Like let's call let's let's do these five curb ramps, or we need to put in a bunch of rapid flashing beacons. Let's call these these five rapid flashing beacons one project even though they they address needs at different schools if that we find that you're that that it won't it won't affect the ability of your project to compete and if it's if the project makes more sense somehow if i need to i'll call you and i'll and, and we'll and we'll fix it but you won't get uh, disqualified in any way without without us talking about it and fixing it and fixing whatever the issue was so um, I know that's not super clear, but it's sort of like, if it makes sense financially to do it all together, then um, tell that story. And one, one jurisdiction could have several different applications mm -hmm. granted. Yeah, and we would fund up to $2 million. And so that's actually a perfect uh, transition to the next question here, which was, is $2 million max for this cycle of the project total including match or just the grant request amount? Just the grant request. Great question. So match um, would be an additional 20 to 40 percent on top of that. Great. Um, another quick one. 
um, which school year of data report card data will be used um, 18 19 17 18 either you can use either great um, a longer question here um, how do you score a project application that would benefit a high school and an elementary school if the components of the project hit the different criteria for example if a priority safety corridor crosswalk is proposed that is um, three-fourths of a mile from an elementary school but it also benefits a high school or middle school that is a quarter mile away would it get points for both benefiting an elementary school and the close proximity for the high school if they have re different reduced lunch rates or other equity numbers do you choose the higher reduced lunch rate um it would i mean for the points wise the you you need to kind of pick a focus school of your application like the main school that's the benefit of the of the project and so if that's the elementary school and it's three quarters of a mile away then you would get the you wouldn't get the points for for proximity but that's such mm -hmm. a amount of points that i don't think it would really matter we're really trying to build projects that are mainly for elementary and middle school students if that makes sense um, I know there were other questions in there. Um, I think that. Okay. Call me. I think you answered it. You guys are getting real specific with these questions, which is great, but I'm not able to have a back and forth with you, which is hard. <laughs> and so um, please uh, shoot me an email um, or give me a call and we can talk about the, the very specifics. I'll do the best I can. Um, great. Couple more. Um, is there a weight given to one applicant type over another? If a project is within a city but on a county road within a school district, is there more weight given to who actually submits the application? It doesn't matter. If I understand correctly, it does not matter who submits the application. You're not scored based on who submits it. But I think they're asking like between different jurisdictions, like are you trying to work with any specific uh, oh. jurisdictions in particular? No, not in particular. We, I mean, we have a kind of a preference for whoever submits the application to deliver it because that seems to be the easiest. And um, switching any of that later on just takes a lot of um, like administrative work that, that uh, it's complicated. So. I, I kind of just prefer if you're submitting it that you're the one delivering it, but there's no um, there's no scoring based on that. I just just knowing from experience, it makes it easier to um, for on our end and on your end to to sign the papers and get things moving. Thanks. Uh, will will um, the grant allow paving for bike lanes? can pave those bike lanes. Great. Um, I think this was referring to like whether how staff time could be counted towards match. Um, and the question is, even if staff time is um, doing the design, construction, management, et cetera, is this different from last time? The, the staff time actually used um, we can't, basically we can't do, we can't really do over, like overhead. <laughs> we can't, we can't really keep your lights on, but we can pay people to do work to deliver the project. Um, if that makes sense. And it's not different from last time. There's no change for how. No, it should be same. Uh, to staff the time's time. being treated. It should be the same as last time, which is that um, that uh, staff work done on that project is billable to the project in the same way that if you were um, hiring a consultant, the consultant is um, billable to that project. Good. Um, all right. 
does having a reduced speed school zone on a street change the speed limit considered under the grant criteria? Does having a reduced speed school district on the street change the criteria? I think they're asking like, is the, for determining like a, prior, a priority corridor, is the speed limit, the posted speed limit or the reduced um, speed, school speed zone speed limit? Um, I kind of think it, it, it a little bit, um, it a little bit depends like uh, if people are actually following that speed limit when the when, like is that is it 20 all the time or is it 20 like I think that since every situation is a little bit different um, I would lean towards like um, if like if it's all the time 20, then it's then it's 20 miles an hour. If it's uh, like w wind flashing and nobody ever nobody actually slows down, like then you don't then then use the speed limit that people are going. Um, it's I think it's a little bit there's a little there's a little bit of nuance there because each speed zone is a little bit different. Um, in how it's in how it's set up and schools are different in how they use their time and space. So if the speed zone doesn't match how the school is using the time and space, then I would use what the speed limit is that people are driving when kids are when kids are crossing. Great. Uh, okay. Next question. Um, we have a six million dollar sidewalk project next to school that uses federal funds in the MPO tip. And the local match is about $200,000 above the minimum match. But with COVID and the expected reduction in gas tax revenues, the project may be jeopardized. Can this jurisdiction apply for $200,000 grant to help cover the expected loss of local funds? Uh, that's a complicated one. I think that you need to, I mean, uh, like, there's a part, there's, if. I think they're asking, like, could they apply to get the match for this larger grant? Yeah, I mean, you can use this as match for a larger grant. If it's a federal grant, then it would be federalized. Um, but basically you just describe the larger project um, and then t talk about this as your safe routes to school uh, fund piece of that project. Um, but maybe call you for And then the federal, discussion. then the federal funds would match the state funds. Basically, I don't think it matters that, that you were going to pay for it and now you can't pay for it. And so now you need to apply for a grant. Um, as long as it's not like bike bill stuff, like like you were you're, you're building something and and you're and you're applying for this to 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 take care of like the very minimum bike ped parts of it, like I can't see how that would not be eligible. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Next question. Um, what number slash portion of the projects funded last time were for sidewalk infill? Um, unknown. Um, yeah. Yeah, not sure. We didn't, we don't, we didn't choose projects based on what they were building. We've scored projects based on the uh, current atmosphere. So, um, Okay. I can think of okay. three, but I bet there are more. I bet there are more than that. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, points are awarded for projects that have a conceptual design. How is this defined? What needs to be completed to be in conceptual design? Um. Uh, 
Um, I would have to uh, think more about that. Um, I would imagine that you uh, have have a have a local definition of what conceptual design is and, and when that and when that happens. Like it's like basically what your what your local process is. Um, if you um, send me send me a note about that one. Um, there, I'm sure there is a real definition for what is conceptual uh, or what is design. Um, for the concept, uh, like preliminary, anything that's preliminary, go ahead and turn that in. That'll that'll give partial points. Basically, like, are you done with your are you done with your design? I don't anticipate every, anybody being done, honestly. If you said you were completed with your design and you submitted something that wasn't a like a, a pretty complete design, then I would we would probably call you and ask um, if this is just sort of like part part of your design. But you can send me an email about it, but um, that's something that I can't verbalize as well. Um, would flashers to change school zones from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. to when flashing be an eligible project? If that's something that you came up within your school as a, as a priority, and there was a direct relation to the what the project uh, what the problem was that you were uh, identifying um you want to change it from a timing to a wind flashing yeah it's just like changing the the sign yeah, yeah. um that goes with an rrp yeah okay. yeah if you're if you're upgrading to something that works better for your community All right, cruising right along here. Next question. Will ODOT require an ODOT curb ramp inspector to measure any ramps we install or can the certified inspectors in my office complete the inspection reports? Yes, unless it's on ODOT right of way. If it's on ODOT right of way, then we have to send somebody out to inspect it. If it is on your own right of way, all we do is do at the end of the project, we do a walkthrough and we have the scope in front of us and we just look and see if you completed what was in your scope. Um, conversely, if you do build something on ODOT right of way, then that portion of the project will um, have an ODOT inspector come out and inspect it, especially the curb ramps. But only if a local entity is building on ODOT right of way. And that, those are kind of rare instances. Um, do we need to submit one application per project or could you put multiple projects in one application? You can put multiple projects in one application, but the, it's got to be, um, like we were saying before, it has to like make sense in some, in some sense of the, the, uh, project that like, this is all one cohesive project. Um, there are just different pieces to it. If that doesn't make sense, and if you can't describe it like that, then separate it out into um, smaller, smaller projects that you can apply for separately. And would you say that they need to have like something more in common than like the seafronts to school projects in our city are this, so they're cohesive. Like it should be like a similar type of infrastructure or like. Um, that's my thought process. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. If, if someone submits something that is like, I'm sure there are things out there that I haven't thought of, but um, like make, make the argument that this is one project and it makes sense to do it all together as one project. Great. Um, does every community with an approved Safe Routes to School plan get money this cycle? No. Um, the project identification program was kind of set up to help small communities um, identify projects that don't have the capacity to do so. So um, having a plan is, is going to be nice, but it does not give you any additional points. It doesn't give you any additional advantage. It's um, helping provide some uh, capacity assistance for small communities that don't have the capacity to identify any safe routes to school projects. Um, Staff time as match. I think you've answered that one. Mm -hmm. that, no, that no, you can't use staff time as match. 
Um, you can, you can't use volunteer time as match staff time, um, uh, as part, like not, not overhead, not like keeping the lights on, but, uh, people who are working on this specific project can, um, those are, those, those can be reimbursable expenses. And if it can be a reimbursable expense, it could also be used as cash, uh, used as part of cash match. Does that make sense? But volunteer time, no, like on, on, on soft, soft match, you can often use people who are volunteering their time or anything like that. Um, but, uh, but people who are working specifically on this project to get it built, uh, their staff time is uh, reimbursable and therefore it could also be used as cash match. And that's for people building the project. Um, not necessarily like planners if they're doing, doing preliminary designs or if they're doing work directly related to getting the project on the ground. Right. Um, next question, if multiple projects are included in a single application, is there room for revision during the selection process? Well, say that one more time. If multiple projects are included in a single application, is there room for revision during the selection process? This was like, I think a follow-up question to um, multiple projects what you were saying before. So when you submit a project, you've submitted that project. If when going through all the applications, we see a red flag, remember when I went over that slide about like, hey, this is how we're gonna determine red flags. If we sort of see a red flag or have a big major question, will come back to you and you will have an opportunity to address that and update that as part of your application. But once your application is submitted and you send me an email saying, oh, actually we really wanna change everything, that's not okay. So it can be updated if we're addressing a red flag. Does that make sense? But they're not due to August 31st, so you can you have you have some time to to figure out all of your details. Um, two more questions here, and then I'll double check the chat window that we answered um, all okay. the ones that came in that way. There was there was only a couple. Um, if a community is building a component of a larger project this year with some federal funds, and we want to use that project as match to our Safe Routes to School grant, does that federalize the whole Safe Routes to School project? Yeah, if you're done with the federal project and it's closed out, then you can use that work completed without federalizing the project. But if it's still sort of open, um, then, uh, then it federalizes the project. And so you should consider that when you're writing your budget. And then um, this is a question about right of way. Does a public trail easement on private property count? Would that be eligible? It has to be public road right of way. So really, um, uh, it can't be. Um, I mean, if if it's an easement that a road is built on, then that could that could work, or that a road is planned to be built on. Um, but really, it needs to be in the public road right of way. So the easement's not the issue, it's the road part. Thanks. And then... Um, We're right at about 12.30, Katie. Do you think we have time for one more? And then um, maybe uh, if there's a way for you to send me all the additional questions or folks... I think we actually, I think we answered them all looking through the, the couple um, in the chat. I think, I think you answered okay. them. If you have any yeah. additional questions, please feel free to give me a call or um, shoot me an email. Also, if you have any feedback from the first round, I'd be really happy to hear it um, and keep learning through this process. Really, this funding and this program is for you to help address your needs. Uh, we have to follow some of these guidelines based on like where the funds coming from and how to implement something from a bureaucracy but i'd really like to hear what challenges that you're having and if there's ways that we can meet those challenges so please feel free to send me any feedback from the first round 
And here is our contact information uh, from me and Katie. So feel free to um, contact us with any questions, um, me about the application process. If you have anything specific about the project identification program, you can reach out to Katie. We can also reach out to me and I can connect you. Um, thank you very much for all of your time. I hope that you're um, all doing well during this really intense and crazy time. I am in a basement office trying to figure out how to um, work from home, but um, our, our thoughts are with all of you. Thank you for being a part of this and still pushing forward with safe routes to school, even though um, all of everything is up in the air. We appreciate your time and um, wish you all health and um, sanity <laughs> for the next, for however long this lasts. So we hope you're all doing well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.